Hey, what's up guys? My name is Ashona. Welcome back to my game engine series. So last time we took a look at entry points and how we actually had to kind of define an entry point for both our engine and application, how all of that worked. Definitely check out that video if you haven't already. And today we're going to be taking a look at logging and how we can actually use a logging library in our engine so that we can log things to the console in various like special colors and just everywhere throughout our code base. With some special tags and anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun. First of all, I just want to give a huge thank you, as always, to all the patrons that make this series possible. If you guys aren't supporting the series, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the churno. Uh, this series just wouldn't be here without you guys, so huge thank you, as always. And uh, as, a, as a reward for supporting this series, you'll also get things like source code to the actual Hazel engine that I've already written um, as I'm writing it, kind of just immediately, as well as videos a week early. So it's always interesting when I make these videos because in a sense, I'm making it for like one group of people a week before the second group of people. So by the time this video is actually public for everyone, for the whole internet, like I've already long forgotten about it because I've already made the next video for patrons. But anyway, let's get into logging. So what is logging? Why do we need it? And what are we going to do here today? So logging is just a way for us to basically log events, right? Um, I say events in kind of a liberal sense, like because Events can really, really be anything. Like anytime I want to be like, hey, something happened, right? I want to essentially have a way of the engine communicating with us, the humans who are both developing it, but also possibly using it, right? So a good example is we started the engine, right? Let's print off the kind of system initialization things that happen, maybe even system information, um, information, I was going to say system information, information, like system, information about the system that we're running on, um, whether or not things, certain things worked, whether or not certain files were opened, whether or not like shaders were compiled successfully. There's so much information that we need to basically give as feedback because um, to me at least, like a good piece of software is very kind of client facing in the sense that like when you write a piece of software that is even moderately complicated, when things go wrong, you want to know what's actually happened, right? The, your computer's running all of this code. It's doing all of these complicated operations, especially as the code base grows. It's going to be doing all of these complicated operations, but it's going to be kind of keeping it to itself. That's not what we want, right? Because if something goes wrong, or even if something goes right, we have no idea of actually seeing what's happened. And I really like to know what is going on, right? I just have to know what the computer's done and what state it's kind of in, right? And that's where logging comes in. Logging is a way for us to actually, as we write our code, as we write our complex code, to communicate back to ourselves and basically say, okay, so I tried to do this, this happened, this, this is the status, this is what's going on, this is what I'm gonna do next, or this was an error, you know, maybe fix this. You know, there's so many things like warnings as well. There's so many things we wanna do. So apart from just being able to communicate back to ourselves via like a printf or a, like standard C out or something like that, we also probably want information about where that message is coming from, as well as potentially the severity of that message. So instead of just being like, you know, here's like a bunch of, you know, text being printed in our console, we might want to use different colors. So like errors might be red, warnings might be yellow, normal stuff might be green, stuff that's not important might be like gray or something. There's like kind of this whole system that we want um, that really provides us like with a way to just easily be able to like scroll through our running console and be like, oh no, I saw a red message there. Let's investigate that. That's probably something wrong. Or maybe we you know yellow is probably not that great, but we can kind of ignore it. Um, <laughs> There's so many things that we want to kind of deal with. So because of that, we're not going to be writing our own logging library. Um, we could do that. That would take a while, maybe like a week's worth of episodes as in like a week's worth of work really is what I was going to say. Um, but the idea is that um, the biggest issue with logging, I think, is formatting different types, right? So printing just hello world or whatever is easy because we can just be like, this is my text string. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of it. That's done. Right. But when we actually have, if you actually look at a real kind of engine code base and you want to print stuff, you want to print much more than just text, right? You want to print numbers. You want to print objects. You want to print pointers. You want, there's so many things that we want to print and we need a good way to format that string properly and string formatting, running a good kind of C sharp style string dot format function is a lot of work and probably about a thousand lines of code, right? So it's not something that I really want to spend time on in this series. 
Um, I'm just kind of trying to give you guys, I guess, the reason I'm explaining all this in a way, instead of just writing code, um, is just because I kind of want to give you guys an idea of what's actually going through my head when I decide, okay, we're not going to write this ourselves, we're just going to use a library. Um, and for this, it's literally because of the fact that um, I want to be able to support uh, string formatting and probably like, you know, a, a, an undetermined amount of arguments um, for our actual log message. And that's something that it's much easier to just take something good that has been written um, and reuse it instead of kind of writing everything ourselves because then this would take all year. Um, anyway, so we're going to be using a library called spdlog. Um, so if we just open up GitHub over here, um, what I've got here is just the GitHub page open. I'll leave this in the description. Um, I've, also, I've also started um, so you guys can check this out for yourselves. It's very, it's quite fast. Um, it even runs in asynchronous mode and there's a really nice usage sample here that you can kind of look at yourself. Um, the primary things that I like are, you know, stuff like formatting. I mean, if you look at this, these are the, the different kind of messages that you have, warn, critical info, whatever. Um, we don't have to use, we can use any kind of subset of these as we choose, but you can see that the way that they log messages is very kind of C-sharp style. Um, how they've basically got uh, which argument this refers to, so the, the first one, the only one, um, and then different formatting uh, options for kind of that argument, and you know, you can do like, you know, arguments in different kind of order, and anyway, this is just, this is just great, it's very C-sharp style, which is like really good, um, and I really like it. Uh, and also if you look at the license, of course, which we need to do for every library that we use, it's the MIT license, you can see we have um, all the permissions um, that we need as long as we actually retain this copyright notice, which of course we will uh, inside our engine. Okay, cool. So now that we've decided to use this, how do we use this? Now I could make an entire video on the proper way to use third-party libraries in your code base, because guess what? <sighs> there is no proper way, basically. There is C++, C++ is dealing with kind of modules or like just libraries is just not, there's no real standard way. Like people will have different ways. People might be like, oh, you know, use CMake, use kind of your own system. You should, if you're using Git, maybe use submodules. Like it doesn't, there's, there's no kind of language defined way to actually import libraries and use them. So maybe I will make a video on various ways to do it and what I've kind of found throughout my kind of career. Um, but a lot of the times it basically comes down to Pick a build system that you want to use, such as CMake or Premake or something like that. Um, and then just make sure that every library that you use, you kind of write a, you write that into your build system. And then for things like this, you either can kind of maintain them separately and just update them kind of as updates come out, or you can add them like as a Git submodule. If you're using Git, you can add them as a Git submodule. That's probably the best way to do it for that. Um, but there's still kind of no, there's no right way to do things. Um, and eventually things will go out of date or eventually like you'll run into a library you want to use that doesn't use the build system you use. So you'll have to write your own kind of, you know, for example, I want to use something. I'm using CMake as an example. I'm not actually in this series and probably won't. But anyway, I'm using CMake. Um, I decided to use this. This doesn't have CMake. Okay. I have to write my own CMake lists file to make this compile for CMake and then kind of use that in my code. That's essentially something that you'll probably end up having to do um, for libraries unless everything happens to use the build system that you're using um, and also happens to be, for example, on Git as like on, ver on Git's kind of version control system um, so that you can just use it as a sub module. So anyway, the whole thing's a mess um, and I'm not, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but let's actually just kind of download this into our project. So what we could do, there's a number of things that we could do. We could just clone or download this, um, just download a zip file and unzip it into our directory. We could clone this into its own directory and then copy the files. Or what I'm going to do is actually add it as a sub module to our Hazel repository. So what this means is that we don't actually kind of have the code base um, in our code base. It's basically like, it's basically we're referencing an existing Git repository somewhere else that's kind of at a remote address. Um, and then when we actually clone Hazel and we say also clone all the sub modules, it clones that. And the reason that that's kind of useful is because it kind of keeps their kind of code intact um, as well as lets us kind of easily like kind of update to new code changes from their repository without kind of having to do anything manually. We can just update um, 
we can just update that specific submodule because it is a submodule and it's not actually copied and pasted code into our own repository. I may actually make kind of a standalone video on Git submodules in the future because using this, using it in the context of this probably isn't the best example, but basically all I'm going to do is copy this address here and then come down into Hazel. I'll open a command prompt window here and I'm going to just type in git sub module add. And now I have to, I'll, I'll paste in the path, um, or oh, sorry, the URL to the actual git repository. And then what I'm going to do is specify where I want it to actually add this code into. Now you can see that this is really nice. This is really nicely done. Um, I mean, it's got like include SPD log and that's really kind of the only thing that we need. Um, even though there's so much other stuff, um, like what I'm saying is that in kind of into our include path, really, this is the only thing that we need. Um, but that's okay. We'll sort that out later. Um, so what I'll do is, uh, where I want to store all of these third party libraries is going to be kind of in the solution directory. Um, probably inside Hazel itself, because I don't think that this will be like, we should probably have third party libraries per project rather than for the entire solution. So inside Hazel, I'm going to make a folder called vendor, right? Which is going to refer to all third party libraries. Um, and then the name of this library, which is going to be SPD log, because obviously I don't want all of these files just in my vendor folder. So that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to hit enter. Um, and then it's going to actually clone that repository into that project. And what you'll also see once it finishes is a file appear in our actual root directory called git modules. And if we just kind of open that file, I'll just open it with visual studio at this point, you can see that it's created a new sub module in this path. Um, there's the path and there's the URL that it's kind of linked to. Okay. So this is what actually kind of defines that sub module and inside Hazel, you'll see vendor SPD log, and then here it is. Okay. So what we need to include in our project to get access to this is include, and then, well, we can keep this, uh, like this. So basically this is the path we need. So I'm going to copy this path and I'm going to paste it, um, into, we'll go right click properties for our actual, uh, Hazel project. I'm going to go to C, C++ and then additional include directories under general for all configurations and our only platform here. I'm going to add this. Okay. Pretty simple. Um, now because this is actual Hazel, um, what I'll do is I'll make kind of a universal path, uh, that works for all projects because we will have to actually include this in sandbox as well, since this is kind of a header library. Um, so solution directory and then Hazel vendor SPD log include. Okay. Copy this, uh, go to sandbox, hit yes here, um, and I'll paste this into here. Now this is going to get a little bit annoying when we switch to using a build system. We'll obviously define this nicely in the build system. Um, so we won't have to kind of keep track of it here in these property pages, which can get a little bit annoying. Okay, cool. That is done. Now we can actually start using that library. So let's make our own wrapper for it. So now at this point we could just kind of use SPD log as SPD log, but we obviously don't want to kind of have like SPD log log or whatever stuff in our actual client game, right? This is the Hazel engine. We should have Hazel log or something like that. That's important for a number of reasons. First of all, I want to change the API. I don't want it to look like their API because their API is actually quite verbose. We want something really simple. This is a log. This is kind of like a logging system for an engine. So really this should be macrofied um, as kind of like a global macro that we can use per log level or something like that. Um, we don't want to have to like start dealing with namespaces or having like long kind of strings of text. This is like completely unnecessary, but also if further down the line, we decide to replace this logging library with another log library, we should be able to host swap that kind of out without actually having to change any client code because we want our game code. Like when people use the Hazel engine and start doing things like logging a message. And like, if we decide to change something internally, we don't want them to have to go through their code base and kind of change the API that they've been using because we've decided to change something as minimal breaking changes as possible is what we kind of want. So because of that, we're going to create a log class, which kind of wraps a lot of SPD logs functionality and just ends up calling kind of, uh, static functions, I guess, that will then forward kind of arguments or whatever to SPD log. So we're basically just creating a wrap up. Let's just go ahead and do that. So over here, um, under Hazel, I'm going to right click, hit add new item. Um, we're going to just create a class and we're going to call it log. Okay. Um, we're going to have uh, log.h, log.cpp, hit okay. And there we have our log class. So I'm going to type in namespace Hazel. 
um, this is going to be class hazel api log we'll include core.h um, now this has probably made it in the wrong place let's just move this into the hazel uh, folder here okay so we've got core.h we're going to go into log.cpp um, and also make sure this is a namespace hazel And that looks pretty good to me so far. Okay, so now I'm not sure why this isn't working. It's totally in the same directory. So we'll just assume that that's Visual Studio being weird. Um, so now we need to think about how we can actually use uh, SPD log. So um, the way we're gonna do that is really just include SPD log slash SPD log. Um, we're gonna have to do this in the header file and you'll see why in a minute. But now we just wanna kind of define what our, our actual API will kind of look like, as well as probably some macros so that we can kind of easily call logging functions as required. So SPD log actually has quite a nice example um, that we're gonna kind of steal some code from. Um, you can see that we create a new console by just kind of creating this kind of multi-threaded console. We give it a name um, and that name's gonna be important uh, later as well because it's going to kind of be appended to the beginning of every message. Um, and then we can kind of, we have different varying types. So what I'm going to do is actually kind of, we're gonna make two consoles, one for the client, one for the actual engine. So we'll call one core, I guess, um, and one which will actually be kind of our app, I guess, console. Um, and uh, we're going to obviously abstract all this away so that it's not a lot nicer than having to call like member functions like this. Um, and then we're also gonna probably set our own formatting option because we can actually use set pattern here to set like, I guess, like a format for how all log messages will kind of get printed. So let's go ahead and do that. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna get rid of this. Um, I'm gonna make an init function because we definitely need one of those. And then I'm going to make an inline static uh, std shared pointer. Um, I think it's spd log, sp like logger or something like that. Yep spd log logger uh, we'll return that by reference and this will be kind of our core logger so we'll have two we'll have our core logger which will return our let's just say core logger which we will make here and then we'll also have our client logger client logger um, which as you can imagine are just going to end up being s core logger and s client logger also include memory.h, or just memory, um, so that we can use shared pointers. Okay, cool. So there we go. We've got two kind of loggers set up here and an, an initialization function. Let's go over here. Um, we'll have to define these two in our actual uh, translation unit here. So we'll say log core logger and log client logger. Um, they're just shared pointers here. Uh, and we'll have our void init. I'm really kind of getting annoyed about Visual Studio's um, auto formatting not working here. Let me just try and build this. Okay, so le legal reference uh, to non-static. Okay, yes, of course these need to be static. Um, let's compile that again. Okay, good, succeeded. Again, I'm not sure with this IntelliSense or whatever's going on is Really annoying sometimes in Visual Studio, but whatever. Okay, so now let's kind of create these two uh, loggers that we actually have. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is actually uh, set the pattern for kind of how we're going to actually log our messages. This is like the format. Um, so if you go over here and you go to, I think the wiki, um, and we go into custom formatting, you can see that they've actually got uh, examples of kind of how you can use these patterns and a bunch of flags, which says like which part of the message it will print. Um, and so using this, I've kind of prepared a pattern um, earlier, which is basically this. Uh, so this will kind of color it in the right way, then have the timestamp, then have the name of the logger, and then have the actual log message. Okay, so we're basically just having kind of the timestamp, um, the name of the logger, so whether or not it's core or client, um, and then our actual message. So it's pretty simple. And all of that will be wrapped within the correct color for that, that kind of severity of message. So now that we've done that, we can actually start creating these. Um, so if we go back to the wiki, um, or rather just the repository and look at their example, you can see that what they do is they create this kind of std out um, color and then mt for multi-threaded. So we're just gonna go ahead and say s core logger equals std, sorry, equals spd log std out color mt. Um, and then the name, okay? So for this, we're actually going to call it 
Hazel, okay? And that's going to be our core logger. We're also going to make one for our clients and I'm just gonna call this one app, okay? Maybe app like that. In fact, I'm also going to make Hazel like this. And then I'm also gonna set the level of which we kind of print messages. So I think if we just do uh, like set level or something, I really wish this would help me out. I think set level is right. Yep, set level and then the actual log level. And again, Visual Studio has just decided to not work at all. So let's just go here and see what it is. SPD level level, and then we have a level enum, which I think is sort of trace is the kind of uh, print everything thing. So we'll just do trace like that. Um, and then we'll do the same thing for client. Okay, so now we're printing all messages from both of these loggers. Probably a good idea to also expose this uh, so that we can actually set our level to whatever we actually want it to be. But for now, we'll just keep it at trace. I'll hit control F7 to compile this file, make sure everything's fine. Okay, so we get uh, SPD color MT is not a member of SPD log. I think what we actually need to do is include another file, um, which is uh, this syncs file. So let's go ahead and include this just in our CBP file. And there you go, everything compiled successfully. All right, so now I want to actually use this stuff in our client. So. What we could do, right, and I will do this kind of as a test for now. Um, in loginit, um, this obviously, this function obviously needs to get called somewhere. So uh, when I got to call, I don't really want to call this in our entry point, um, although I guess we will for now. Um, we do need to kind of have like a system initialization kind of uh, function or something in which the engine actually is initialized. But for now, again, I will call this in here. This remember gets included into uh, sandbox, so that's an important note to make as well. But I'll just say hazel log init, okay? Um, and if we go into hazel.h, I will of course include log here. So we'll do include hazel log. Um, so if I build my sandbox project now, this should work. And if I hit F5, I think it'll just kind of terminate, won't it? Uh, let's maybe stick a breakpoint here and hit F5. Okay, now I need to <laughs> copy that DLL. We really need to make a post build copy step. Um, we will do that next time though. Uh, I'm going to go into bin, debug, hazel, DLL, copy into sandbox, replace, and F5. Okay, so it's running successfully. I forgot that we had the, that while true loop. Um, login it seems to have worked. So maybe now let's try and use something. We'll say get uh, core logger um, and then I guess, nah, let's just do a warn because that should be yellow. Um, we'll say initialized log, okay? And then I'm also going to do the same thing but with the client logger and we'll make this just a, what's another one? Info, I think that's green, so hello. Um, so we should get two different kind of messages from two different loggers here. Okay, cool. So you can see we get a yellow message that says initialize log and it says that it's from Hazel and then from app we get a hello printing and we also have the timestamp, which is cool. All right, so our log is basically done. Now here's the issue. I don't want to call this every time, right? Hazel log, get, get call log or one. That's really kind of annoying. What I want to do instead is create some nice macros that make this really easy to kind of use, okay? So what I'm going to do is outside here, I'm going to make a bunch of defines and then this is basically going to just be define hz core uh, and then the log kind of severity. So I don't know why this is already kind of here. I have no idea why that's, that's can't be coming from anywhere, but I'll probably just type that code sometime in my life. Um, so what we'll say hz core and then error, for example, um, dot, 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 right? Because we're gonna have a variable number of arguments. And then we're just going to call uh, hazel log get core logger because that's hz core error. Um, and then we'll say error and then uh, underscore underscore va args, right? Which is just forwarding our variable arguments that we had in our macro to our actual function, okay? And that's that. We're not gonna put a semicolon or anything because we'll do that after we use the macro, but that's basically it, right? And if you wanted to, you could wrap this in another macro that only enabled it under certain circumstances. Maybe, um, well, that would be definitely important because we want to strip out all of our log messages in distribution versions. Obviously, we don't want to be, we don't want, we don't want to be wasting any kind of performance logging messages to the console. That's probably not even going to be visible um, when we distribute our actual applications. Okay, but we'll deal with that later. Um, so we have core error. We'll do probably warn info and trace. I think is probably going to be enough. So error warn info and trace. Okay. 
So trace will be trace, this will be info. There's also a fatal one, but we're not gonna worry about that, I think, for now. And warn. Let's kind of organize these uh, in order of severity. So we'll do trace, info, warn, error. And in fact, you know what? I might as well do fatal because I think I'm gonna want to use that for assert messages um, or something like that, perhaps. Um, so fatal. Okay, cool. And I will kind of just nicely align this. I don't want to use tabs or anything because that can not work depending on your tab size. So let's just use the space bar here to make sure they're nicely aligned. And we have all of our kind of core logging, I will say, core log uh, macros, okay? And then we're gonna do some client ones. So client log macros. So we're gonna copy all of these, and the only difference is going to be the fact that they don't say core. We'll actually strip that entirely. It'll just be A to Z trace and all that stuff. Um, we're going to align these, whoops, align these like that. Um, and then instead of core logger, I'm going to just use client logger, okay? And that's it, there we go. We've got all of our different ones. Hopefully I didn't make any mistakes here. A trace info one error fatal uh, for both of these looks great. Um, now I'm just going to go back into our entry point. Um, and instead of this now, you can see this is just gonna become HZ core warn, okay? And then this just becomes HZ info, okay? Um, let's just print like a variable or something just to make sure that works. Um, int a equals five, okay? Because uh, that should work as well, of course. We should have variable messages uh, or rather variable kind of um, arguments that we can actually pass in here. Uh, let's hit a five and see what happens. And we only modified the uh, header files. So of course, we don't need to copy that DLL. Okay, there we go. Initialize log, hello, var equals five. You can see everything works uh, correctly and it was really easy and it looks really nice now. And the other, obviously, the other requirement for this being a macro, which I forgot to mention, but I kind of did just then, um, was that uh, if this isn't a macro, it's a function that always gets called. But if it's a macro, it means we can strip it from distribution builds. So if I just basically say, you know, if this is a dist build, um, I can define this to be nothing, just like that. And that means that that gets stripped from the actual build um, and is not included in the binary, which means that we're not running this in distribution builds, which is very, very important. That's probably the main reason, um, not just to make our lives easier, but for actually stripping code out um, when required. So anyway, that's kind of that. Um, uh, we do definitely need some kind of system initialization uh, kind of uh, function. So Hazel in it or something, Hazel core in it or something like that. We'll talk about that next time for sure, because as we start to initialize certain things, we definitely don't want to be doing this in the kind of main function that it gets included into our app. We want to do that somewhere in the core engine. Um, and then also I'm getting really sick of this kind of DLL not being copied. So I think we're actually going to switch to using a build system next time. So that should be fun. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit the like button. We've now got a great logging library that we can actually use. That's going to be really important. I wanted to get that in there as soon as possible because now we have a proper way to start giving feedback as to what's going on to the actual console, which is going to be just so useful for pretty much everything. Um, huge thank you as always to all the patrons that make this possible. Patreon.com forward slash the channel is that link. You can help support the series. Um, it really does help me kind of make videos. W wouldn't be here without you guys. So huge thank you. And you'll get access to much, much more source code than you see in these videos because as I'm kind of making these videos, I'm also actually writing the Hazel engine on the side and kind of as quick as I write it is as like, that's the source code that you get. So as I'm writing it and I do commits, patrons get that source code immediately. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Next time, um, we're probably going to use, finally switch to using a build system because first of all, I want to start getting this code probably working on Mac and Linux as well, because I know there's a fair few of you guys who, um, are using that. I, as I said, I, I am going to write it kind of Windows only to begin with in terms of the just, I'm going to implement the Windows platform only. The engine will still be structured in a way that supports multiple platforms. Um, but I do want to have like, since people have been like, oh, but I'm using Mac, I'm using Linux. It is generally speaking a good idea to be able to build this code easily on Mac and Linux. So that's why I want to start using a build system. Um, and also we can like, I mean, you know, as soon as we start kind of actually modifying our project files by adding so many include parts and also like a post build copy step, for example, which we need to copy that DLL automatically, instead of adding that stuff to Visual Studio manually, it's better to just finally dump that into an actual build system kind of file, essentially a configuration file, so that we don't have to then copy everything across later as our engine and project files get more complicated. 
Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.